It has been two weeks since a gunman murdered 18 people and hurt more than a dozen others in Lewiston, Maine. In that time, we've seen report after report about the warning signs the suspected shooter showed in the months before the attack. In May, police say his family reported concerns about his mental health and access to guns. The U.S. Army, where he served as a reserve officer, had revoked his access to firearms while on duty. And in September, a fellow reservist warned their superior officer in text obtained by the Boston Globe that he heard the shooting suspect, quote, threaten the unit and worried he was, quote, going to snap and do a mass shooting. So how did all of these warning signs go unheeded? And what about measures like Maine's yellow flag law, which allows police to temporarily remove guns from people they believe pose a threat to themselves or others? Well, I'm joined by Margaret Groban, a former federal attorney and current adjunct professor at the University of Maine School of Law, and Jack McDevitt, criminology professor at Northeastern University and the former chair of the state's Gun Violence Reduction Task Force. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for, for having us. us. So, uh, I mean, this has been such a, a moment, especially for folks in the Northeast, as they're touched by the events of what happened. Uh, Margaret, I want to start with you, because I don't think a lot of folks know the difference between red flag laws, which I'm sure folks have heard about, and a yellow flag law. Well, thanks for this opportunity, because uh, there is a lot of confusion about the difference between a red flag and a yellow flag. And I, unfortunately, this tragic incident has shown how this law is so deficient. And I hope that our state will move forward now in light of this tragedy and pass a red flag law. In, in Maine, we are the only state in the country that has a yellow flag law. And I think that we're not, we are an outlier rather than a model for what should happen going forward. In a yellow flag law, uh, first, law enforcement must be involved. So that means if a family member or close, per close personal friend is in crisis, they must call law enforcement who responds to the scene and they have to put that person in protective custody. Although it's not an arrest, it looks a lot like an arrest and that person will be put in the back of a squad car and taken somewhere where they can get a mental health assessment. And I use the word assessment um, intentionally because they aren't getting treatment. All they're getting is an assessment from a mental health professional that they are likely to be, uh, that they are, there's a likelihood of harm to themselves or others. So first the police make the determination that there's probable cause to believe they're a danger. Then the mental health professional makes that assessment and only then do they go to the judge for the judge to then either endorse or not endorse, uh, the, the firearm relinquishment order, and then law enforcement has to go and seize the weapons. So it's a three-step process, and I think it's two steps too many. Mm. Jack, would you agree with that assessment? Because I know in Massachusetts, we do have a, a red flag law choosing to be more strict in this. Yeah, I, th I think I, I agree with Margaret. Uh, it is a, an additional step in Maine. Um, when we were trying to decide, I was chair, as you mentioned, of a task force to change the Massachusetts law, we had a series of hearings, and one hearing was with mental health professionals. We said to them, can you predict who's going to be dangerous? Are you in a place to tell us this person is? And they said, no, we can't predict. So then we turned to the police chiefs, and we said, can you predict? And they said they couldn't predict. And we were sort of at wit's end, like, how do we get someone who could say this person is going to be dangerous? And what we came down to was the people who most likely would be impacted and would know that someone's going through a personal crisis would be their family and friends. So what we said in Massachusetts was we we're going to empower those people to go in and request the law, like request the, the firearms be removed. Um, so I, I think it's it's more in line with the other laws in the other 20 states that have them in the United States. But it is the case that, that Mar in Maine, Margaret's right, there's a two-step process that is cumbersome and time-consuming. Margaret, I want to ask you, there's a difficulty in removing firearms from someone who already has them, even though this individual here in Maine was involuntarily committed, but he would have had to actually admit that he had guns to have them taken away. Is that correct? 
Well, I, I think yeah, there is a federal law that provides that if someone is voluntarily committed, they can't possess firearms legally. I think we're still waiting, at least I'm still waiting for confirmation that he was involuntarily committed. And I, I don't know if that is the case. But even so, if he were, uh, then you don't know that he's a prohibited person. There's no way law enforcement would know that unless they were doing a background check and saw that he was, you know, in the NICS beta database and he could not have firearms that way. But I think what it speaks to is the deficiency in Maine laws, that someone who is in crisis can go and buy weapons of war with relative ease in Maine. Uh, he could hit the AR-10, which I understand is even more lethal weapon, uh, than the AR-15 that does incredible damage um, when it when it's used. So I think it's our weak gun laws in combination with our burdensome yellow flag law that helped contribute, unfortunately, uh, to the mass shooting that occurred here. I want to point out, we actually had John Rosenthal on BPR who spoke, and John Rosenthal from Stop Handgun Violence, as you both probably are aware of that organization, saying that the sale of guns in Maine actually went up after this incident, this mass shooting, and that that's a fairly regular occurrence. Jack, I wonder if you could speak to that, because how do we then make sure that these laws continue to make people feel safe if they're going out and buying more guns because they presumably feel unsafe after a mass shooting? Yeah, John's been a leader in this area for a long, long time, and I, I really respect his work. And he's right. When we look at laws, when we look at incidents, laws being passed, incidents that occur, the, the predominant reaction is to go out and buy more guns. I'm going to get my guns either because they're going to prohibit them and I won't be able to have them or because we, uh, you know, I need to protect myself. I will say that the one thing that, that I do would ask that we sort of think about in terms of this conversation is part of the problem is we think of taking someone's guns away as something that's a permanent, terrible thing to do. And I think we have to reframe that. And people are always saying, well, when we don't want to take his guns away, he'll get mad or they'll get angry, or upset. I said, you know, I think we got to think to ourselves, let's balance the risk versus the reward here. If we take the guns away for a month or two, how much harm is that doing versus somebody who we know to be in crisis and might hurt themselves or hurt others? And I think we, we err on the side of, well, in, if it's not clear, let's not do it. I think we should rethink that and think about how do we make this person, his family, and our community as safe as possible? Margaret, do you think that gun culture and the laws in Maine actually need to change to prevent something like this happening or gun violence writ large, honestly? I, I do. I think that in Maine, we were naive to think uh, that it wouldn't happen here. And, and those of us involved in the gun safety movement, unfortunately, we're saying it's a matter of when, not if. And now, unfortunately, it has happened within our communities. And we have been tilting at windmills trying to get uh, some kind of gun safety law. Maine is ranked F by um, many gun safety groups for the, the strength of our gun laws, which is basically non-existent. So I think it's a it's a reality check for all of us that the easy access to guns and we are a source state for guns. It's not just the, you know, the safety of our community and our state, but the safety of our adjoining states of where our guns are ending up at crime scenes in other states because of how easy it is to get guns here. Mm, interesting. Do you, are background checks enough, though? Because oftentimes the, the first call is like, well, there needs to be better background checks. Um, mm -hmm. It seems like there were other signs, however, that were missed in this case and other warnings that were made before this mass shooting by the shooter's family, by the military branch in which he served. And these things seemed like as we mentioned in the intro, to go unheeded. Jack, I wonder if you think background checks are enough or if there needs to be something beyond that. I think background checks are, are a help. But I think what we did in Massachusetts was to empower local police chiefs to set a higher standard for their community than just a federally prohibited person, as Margaret has explained. I think that what we said to police chiefs is sometimes... People have committed bad things, but they haven't rose to the level of being a federally prohibited person. So what I mean by that is 
you might have a family where there's been domestic violence, but there's never been a restraining order, there's never been an arrest. But the local police chief knows that they've been to that house three or four times and there's been violence. That person shouldn't have a gun. Um, and they shouldn't be able to, so in the Massachusetts, the police chief can say, I'm not going to give you a license because of your violent history. So I think background checks are important, but we probably have to broaden the definition of what a background check is and what kind of information we'd like to use to make a determination about who's suitable to have a gun. Margaret, I'll ask you the same question. Are they enough? And what about these signs that seem to have gone unheeded? Well, to begin with, uh, I don't think they're enough. I think it's part of a system of laws that can all make us safer. I think we need an assault weapon ban. We need background checks. We need a red flag law. And since gun suicide, unfortunately, Mr. Carr did commit suicide at the end of this, which was not unpredictable. But uh, gun suicide is the biggest kind of gun violence we have in Maine. So a waiting period, even as part of that background check, would be really important in the state of Maine. And as far as signs that went unheeded, I think, uh, you know, there's so many facts we still don't know yet. And I think let's wait and see what the commission shows as to what happened here. But I I served on the Maine Domestic Violence Homicide Review Panel because around half of our homicides every year are domestic violence related. And we use that opportunity to gather stakeholders and without judgment, look at how processes and procedures and laws can be improved to try and stop as many domestic violence homicides. So in Maine, we are willing to take away firearms at the temporary order stage for domestic violence abusers, but we've not been willing to do that to other categories of persons who pose uh, dangers as well. And the effect of that community, the effect this has had on that community so profound, even in the weeks afterward, and and will will likely be felt beyond that. Isn't that true, Margo? I mean, you're in Maine. Absolutely. I mean, I I live near Portland, which is our biggest city, but Lewiston is a 45 minute drive. We we were all kind of, if not actually on lockdown, very cautious. We we knew he was heavily armed. It was it was an extremely scary situation. And I would say, you know, Babes College was right there. Those kids were on lockdown. They bought in professors to deliver meals to them in their rooms. I mean, the whole thing was just uh, because it took a couple of days to find him. It was a, a really frightening, frightening situation. And I would say in some ways preventable. So I think we have to sit down now and look at how our policies and procedures are inadequate and hopefully have the legal and political courage going forward uh, to do something to change things. Excellent. Well, certainly a lot to continue to unpack as we figure out exactly all of the events that led up to this terrible shooting and this tragedy and that community hoping that they get what they need in order to heal and uh, somehow move on to some sort of normalcy. Uh, Jack McDevitt and Margaret Groban, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me.